if you're a C, a board or a CEO or an owner, a founder, and you're dealing with this, uh, it's a, you need to understand the talent needed, the experience needed to handle the complexity of this. The answer isn't going to be clear cut, but the, the, the back knowledge of understanding the depth of, of these systems, a, B, that's got to be wedded with a strong understanding of technology because the algorithmic nature of moving all these parts, uh, one human's not going to sort of do it in their head. There's got to be an understanding of how to leverage the, the technology of IT, work with supply chain. Innovators coming out of the woodwork with new ideas and, and hopefully they're able to make it because I know of one uh, you know shipping company that's basically, from what I can see, imploding right now. And it's to do with the leadership in that company, it often comes down to people. I won't name the company, but uh, you know that I think in itself is unfortunate because we're often, you know, as business people and as analysts looking at things, also having to realize that the fallacy of, of humanity and of, of, of individuals, I think, is a huge challenge. You're going to talk to me about supply chain and try and how you're going to fix that. I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> I think you're already behind uh, in a big way. And they're all, there are, I won't name them, but there are retail chains that are, that are not there with digital transformation. And supply chain is changing. It is an evolution happening. It's quick. There's dynamics happening that are geopolitical. There are health issues, everything. You know, you cannot, if you can't respond to that right now, I don't know how you have longevity in this game. You know, the broader the mix, the more challenge it is to deliver the product and service or whatever to your consumers. So, you know, there's a lot of brands that build a lot of product and it's not as productive as it could be. So there's, you know, all these different layers. But I, I think the key is, is understanding that everyone needs to have a seat at the table and you really have to listen to the people that are talking about what's going on with the supply chain and work with them, build relationships, as Gary mentioned. As retailers entered the lockdown in March 2020, a small, diverse group of Canadian thought leaders gathered to virtually speculate, collaborate, and share their insights on the waves of disruption facing retailers. The Business of Retail podcast emerged as an unflinching strategic alternative to the conventional discourse, revealing challenges in the headlines and exploring new, unconventional paths for all facets of the retail industry. Now, here's the panel. Welcome to the uh, latest in the Business of Retail podcast. And as you hopefully know, it's an ongoing discussion. Uh, these aren't one-offs. And uh, if you're new to us, I, uh, I hope you enjoy it and continue to listen through subscription uh, on any of your favorite podcast channels or uh, uh, YouTube. My name is David Ian Gray, and I'm joined today by our regular uh, co-hosts and co-conspirators in this endeavor, Gary Newbury, who I'll explain in a moment why he's so critical in particular today uh, as a, uh, a supply chain exec on call. Um, George Minakakis, who uh, for a number of years ran Lexotica brands in, the, uh, in China and uh, other aspects of the uh, lens crafters in uh, North America. Christine Cowan, who's been a senior merchant at uh, both Adidas and especially Nike over many years out of Portland. And uh, many of you will know Craig Patterson, and if you don't, you should. You should be subscribing to Retail Insider, which is the foremost publication uh, for retail goings on in Canada. Um, today is a subject that I've been looking forward to for quite some time. Uh, my expertise tends to be on store-facing, customer-facing parts of retail, but a number of years ago, I started to realize that where the shift in the industry is really going to center is on supply chain. And uh, meeting Gary, uh, he introduced me to the idea of supply chain of the future superseding store of the future. So today, we're going to really, I think for the first time in our discussion, go deep in the subject. Um, and... Uh, uh, I think what we'll do here is not just talk about what's going on, but speculate a little bit about uh, where, uh, what the implications are, not only for retail, but other parts of the retail ecosystem going forward with all the changes that are happening right now. Uh, let, let's kick off, Gary, with, with you. Just maybe you can give us a bit of a scene set, uh, as much for my edification as anyone else. 
what's the fundamental shift maybe in the last 10 years around uh, how, how retail, particularly in Canada, views supply chain as a function? I think it's uh, helpful, uh, as we, we kind of touched on before we, we opened up the podcast, to actually understand what the supply chain is, because it, you ask, you poke any retailer and try and pinpoint the different activities in, in, in which department, or which silo they sit in, and they can be quite different. But fundamentally, we have two elements of supply chain. We have, where do we get stuff from? Or the supply network, which brings it to the typically to the distribution center, the DC, and then we have a distribution network which gets it to stores or, or through the stores or through other mechanisms to people's homes uh, or, or uh, alongside the store uh, uh, through things like click and collect. So fundamentally, the supply chain's been on a has been responding to many retail concept banners going from growth, maturation, and hitting decline. And during that decline stage, people have been absolutely desperate, retailers have been absolutely desperate to find ways of finding cheaper ways of bringing product in, finding cheaper product just to maintain their gross margin and generate cash flow so they can get to the next quarter, to the next year, to et cetera, et cetera. And that has meant that many uh, supply chains have become geographically diverse or extended, typically focused on product made in the Far East because of the lower regulations, the cheaper labour, and oh, pre-pandemic, pretty much a surety of supply. What has tended to happen is, say, if you're an apparel uh, retailer, you will place an order on a factory. What you may not understand, or you may understand, is so are your competitor and your competitor's competitor, etc. So we, we tended to have a view that the best way to get over minimum order and get the bulky discounts to get the price down is to focus on one factory. If we all collectively, not necessarily collaboratively, but just collectively go to one factory, we fill up that factory's production schedule, make sure they produce, put it on a container, share the container sometimes. So we have um, LCL, less than container load, rather than a full container load, which permits us to have one thing traveling across the, the ocean rather than drip feeding it on, on various boats. And then get it into, into a port, get it onto a truck, typically onto a railhead, move it through the country, uh, by CN or CP to uh, another place where we take it off the train, put it on the road, get it into the DC, stays in the T DC, maybe it's a big promotional item or we're going into peak. Uh, and that's been the, uh, and then we distribute it to stores. That's been the general model for 10, 20, maybe 30 years uh, to varying degrees with more and more focus going to Far Eastern markets because of the reasons that I've mentioned, lower labor costs, lower regulations. The big implications of that, as we found out during the pandemic. Is, is it safe to say that uh, the pre-pandemic model was really driven by efficiency? It was all about, lean, yeah. right? It was about volume and, and stripping costs out. Yeah. And the pandemic, we're now starting to look at, well, what is the risk inherent in our supply chain? Yeah. Suddenly yes. got, surprise, surprise, we took it for granted. And now yeah, we're seeing- People that. talked about risk management, they did their business continuity plans, which, um, you know, talk, the business continuity plan, different from scenario plan, which we talked in previous episodes, the business continuity plan says, how do we keep the business as it is? Uh, and, and that was a joined with a mindset which said, how do we strip costs out? How do we become more efficient? Uh, but we weren't seeing the whole picture. We were looking at invoices, putting them through our profit and loss account and saying, well, you know, our gross margin is good. But what we weren't actually doing was actually really looking at the risks involved and what really is our plan B, C and D. What are the real risks? The geopolitical, the natural disasters, the climate change, the thing like pandemic. Everybody had a BCP with pandemic on it and they evaluated it as no risk. So there was no mitigating action. There was no plan B for a pandemic. What happens if we get a pandemic and then the government does 
things that we wouldn't naturally think they would do, like lock us all down. Uh, it happened on a worldwide scale, and it caused us to have an imbalance in our whole supply chain, because the supply chain has been working on the basis of a drip feed production, going into containers, going onto steady boats, coming to ports, doing that thing, going back empty or picking up uh, exports from Canada, from the US, going back to China. It all kind of worked just fine. It was nice and easy. Well, Christine, you're, you're in a land of uh, recent years, you know, made in the USA. Um, let's repatriate manufacturing, but I'm assuming for Adidas and Nike and the other brands you're connected to, that's not really uh, viable, or is it? Are, are you seeing it in managing risk? Is that one of the options? Well, I think, you know, back to Gary's point, uh, most of the major brands do overseas manufacturing somewhere in Asia. Um, it is cost effective. There is um, the, the level of sewing quality and apparel and um, manufacturing capabilities over there are typically, um, they've invested more in it and they've got the ability to do it. Um, you know, one of the challenges I think with what Gary was talking about is you put all your eggs in the one basket and if something happens to that basket, you know, you've got a bunch of broken eggs. So part of the sourcing strategy is making sure that you've got multiple sources for different products. So you have the ability to tap into that. Um, I think for the majority, China has been a major player in that. And so we all typically kind of go over there um, and or smaller countries in and around that. Doing uh, manufacturing in North America can happen, um, but again, it's at a cost. The labor costs are higher. Um, you also don't necessarily always have the skilled workers that you would want and need to have here. So um, it is done, and there are a lot of great brands that do made in Canada or made in the US, um, but there's a cost factor. And usually by the end of that, the cost factor goes back to the consumer. So we're so, like uh, yeah, so we're looking at sort of the skill sets overseas, but efficiency was the watchword. The other thing that seems to have been happening was Amazon somehow um, kind of defined the discourse on direct-to-consumer by saying it had to be same day. I don't think uh, a god or any anyone one's god ordained that. That was Amazon sort of saying that's how we're going to define the space so that we can get uh, ahead of the competition on our terms is my perception of it. But that really did work. So it seems like the other aspect to this isn't just efficiency and dollars, it's, it's also speed and to be able to get things same day to a consumer. Was that sort of the other? Well, thing? and I, I think you have to parcel it out a bit, kind of to Gary's point, like you've got it coming from overseas to, to land in North America, and then you've got it going to a distribution facility. And then from there, it's parceling out. So I think what's happening a lot more, we've seen this before, but you know, Amazon and um, Walmart and some of these companies are spending, you know, putting in 3 million uh, square foot or a million square foot distribution facilities in key areas so that they can serve out to the consumer in, in those areas. So that's kind of like one piece of it. The, the overseas piece, that's the big challenge. If COVID hits and the factory shut down, the product's not made, the, you know, they're not meeting the deadlines. And then we're basically either shipping what they've got back over to Gary's point, it's not a full container. And then there's all these other sort of challenges in terms of that piece of it from the manufacturing in, but the, the distribution piece and getting it quickly, definitely. I think that's why you're seeing a lot of these big players getting these large distribution facilities. Um, and most large brands already have them, but I think now more than ever, it's having a larger space because there's more product out there. Um, but the chase for same day, I think, isn't easily answered. Uh, and, and I think that's like a, uh, what's interesting about that is in our research that we've done over the last few years with consumers, it's actually not the most important criteria. They want accuracy of order, predictability. Like if it's yeah. going to come next Thursday at two o'clock, make it come at two o'clock with a, a full order. Yeah. But, but this notion of same day seems to be very disruptive. Uh, well, but, but then I also look, if you look at Amazon now, if you're a Prime member, they've started to give options to consumers. So you don't have to get same day, 
if you choose to have fewer packages, you can have this delivery date, or you, you could even set up if you got ongoing deliveries, like I want everything delivered on a Wednesday, I'm willing to wait, I want you to package everything in one thing, and then I want one delivery on a Wednesday. So I think they're getting a little more savvy to that. I, there's still people out there that I want what I want, and I want it now. But, um, you know, I think we're going to start to see a little more of that, like, well, it's better for the environment if I just package everything in one shipment from this place, and then I get it, you know, every Wednesday, or, or maybe it's once or twice a month that I get that shipment. Um, and that's usually for things that aren't like critical nature that people need. Um, and I think, you know, then you've got to look at most likely you're going to other sources for some of that product if you can't get it right away, or if it's something that you need, like, groceries or other things like that so I, I, in terms of the, the thing you just said there about amazon i i've, I've tried to use that option uh, i i had i ordered four things and they had all various you know delivery schedules uh, and i said oh do it on the last day do it on thursday i'm fine with that i don't need it. it's not a rush job as long as i have it before the weekend because it was some stuff for a project uh, and they actually delivered it on tuesday and i think it was two separate deliveries on tuesday I, I, we conceive that, you know, all this thing is just on one shelf and we just put it all in one box yeah. and send it, you know, hand it to the customer. It, their stock yeah. profiling across various territories and where they're sourcing it from and where, you know, it, 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 have they got it in a very forward position, like a, just literally around the corner, or have they got it in their, you know, major DC in your area or how are they, do they have to transit into that? It's a very complex network for them to move uh, they do it you know i think given how much volume they literally process it's, it's unbelievable mm -hmm. on an average day let alone on prime day it's an incredibly complex system they use system of getting stuff to uh to to, to porches and frankly i, I bet you may think it'd be nice to every tip it all off a shelf put it in a box and send it and you know, give it to one driver and I think that they think probably their underlying thinking is if it ha happens to be two or even three deliveries on a day or across days, the most important thing is to get it to the customer. The option wasn't exercised. I exercised it. They didn't deliver against that. They delivered it on the kind of the second day in. Uh, it all came, but on two deliveries. So I think there's still some work that they need to do. But it's it's incredibly difficult to imagine four small items in across the US and Canada, some of it was local, some of it had to come up from, say, Kentucky, to coordinate that onto my doorstep is an incredibly, incredibly big achievement, frankly. And they're doing this millions of times a day across you know, the world. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's hold COVID for a moment because there is a whole COVID impact that may not be a problem in 10 years, but it is a big one right now. But let's hold that for a sec. Craig and George, anything else that you're seeing out there, any aspect of this where you're seeing in the last few years as a trend, a major disruption is catching your eye on the supply chain side? It's not something I focused on quite as much as other areas, but, but certainly uh, one thing that I'm watching right now, and some of it I may not be able to say publicly yet, but you know, Amazon is going out and acquiring a lot of real estate in Canada, including a major shopping center, which it plans to repurpose for... Uh, well, I'm not sure if they know exactly what's going to happen yet, but uh, uh, I, I think this is fascinating because we seem to see this rush where Amazon, uh, again, really wants to get a lot of products as close to the consumer as possible so they can deliver things quickly. I've got a package waiting downstairs and I ordered the stuff last night. It's pretty shocking how quickly these things can come. Um, but even the innovation we're seeing around companies like Walmart, which already, and, and this is something that maybe Gary, you could clarify a little bit. Uh, you know, Walmart almost seems to be a, a logistic, you know, a shipping company in terms of they've always got trucks on the road, right? They're, they're moving stuff around. Obviously, they've got their physical stores and their e-commerce, but they're they're just moving things like like crazy around the country. Uh, I don't know how much what percentage of their stock is on the road, but it seems like it's quite a bit. So so it's it's really really fascinating. And then the speed of uh, uh, of deliveries. I'm just remembering, you know you order something say on the phone i don't know it's six to eight weeks delivery well now we can get in a few hours i mean this is just this is just incredible where we've gone uh, as a consumer society and we're seeing these you know even small shipping companies coming up saying they can deliver in two hours 
someone said 30 minutes. I don't know how on earth that's even possible. It takes me that long just to pick stuff out in a store, or let alone get it to me in 30 minutes. But um, I, I, I mean, it's just it's going to like, disperse it. Like it. Is, seconds, Craig, so. on that point, there's, there's a company in the UK called <clears throat> Screwfix. <laughs> they can deliver in 15 minutes. It's a, a pretty hard. <laughs> Like I'm thinking drone delivery at some point. I mean, I think that's going to be one of the next big ones is, you know, there's a, I don't, I'm not as familiar. I haven't interviewed them, but there's a company called Drone Delivery Canada. And there's a few others out there that, you know, they've either been beta testing. Like I know London Drugs um, way before the pandemic was testing, you know, they were shipping EpiPens. Someone needs it. You need it fast, right? Uh, by drone. And, um, you know, this could be the next big thing as well. I, I'm not an expert again around the flight pass and the laws around that, but uh, it, it seems like things are just getting fast. I mean, I don't know if I can get much faster in, than 15 minutes, uh, but you know, the, the drone delivery thing could be one of the next big things as well. It, it, it's, I don't know where it's going to go because now the tech firms seem to be ruling this and tech firms are going to be an incredibly important part of retail. They already were, but I think more so uh, now than ever, whether or not it's artificial intelligence or whether or not it's, you know, something to do with shipping or, or, you know, a combination of that. We should all have 3d printers and then. Uh, well, that, you know, your neighbor and your neighbor ships it right next door to you. There you go. Yeah, but, I mean, that would be the next step, right, Craig? I mean, where else could it come from? Uh, but I'll tell you what, protect your manufacturing, protect your logistics, protect your distribution center and get it to the customer. Those are the big things. That's what the supply chain is all about. And the consumers right now, you know, we heard four or five years ago, six years ago, convenience is a big deal, right? And it is, and it still is, but it's speed of service now to Craig's point, right? But price is important too. So you're shopping online, you're browsing online, maybe to go to a store or maybe to order from online and receive it and have it shipped to your home. But price comes is, because, is, big, is a big player. It's not going to change. It's all about value at this point. But at the end of the day, you know, there are geopolitical issues that are brewing behind the scenes. And I saw China, you know, in the last week have, you know, they're, they're shutting down some ports because, or a part of a port because a couple of people were sick. It just goes to show you just how vulnerable the whole system is yeah. just because of one step that somebody could take. And what happens in the manufacturing? We've heard that it's happened in Asia as well, where manufacturing has shut down because of some other issues related to the, to the virus. These are, so then it becomes, you know, so what if there's a geopolitical issue and things get shut down? You know, you have to be thinking about that and you have to be planning for it. And I want to believe that Canadian tires move you know, somebody has tipped them off or suggested, hey, we need to start owning part of this somewhere at some stage because George, there are can risks. Can you elaborate to... on that? Just, we may have some listeners who weren't up on that news story. And it is it, it actually spurred uh, our talk today, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Just, just maybe fill us in on the story for the... Uh, Gary, you wanted, you get, you'll give it more justice than I will. Oh, I don't know. You posted the item on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, I know. I did read it before that, though. Uh, yeah, so they've acquired a 25% stake in a terminal, an inland terminal. What was happening before is they would bring it into a terminal, not necessarily this one, and then have to move it by truck in 40-foot containers to a place where it gets transloaded into 53-foot containers. So they'd have, I don't know, two forties or three forties going to two fifty threes, take it down the road and put it onto a rail railhead or transport it to Calgary. If it's coming into Toronto, it's likely to travel by by train because it's cheap and you know, continuous. So they own 25%. I, I did challenge George on his posting. I wonder why it wasn't 51% because that would demonstrate that we are going to manage this facility Control. as opposed to just have a, you know, pass an interest because 25% you can just ter still tell them to push off. We know what we're doing kind of thing. So I, I, that, that was a missing piece in the puzzle, but it is an interesting development for a retailer to even think about taking a, you know, taking a, some kind of interest in a terminal beyond phoning somebody up and said, where's my container? You know, it is a it is a interesting, let's use the term innovation, because not many people would even think about that, let alone go and invest in that. So I think that it's an interesting development. And I wonder when the other big box stores here kind of wise up to that, because we saw about a month or so ago, an announcement was made at Home Depot, this chartering ships 
so that they, they, they fill it up with their stuff, all four containers, I guess, put it on a ship and take it from China and bring it into Los Angeles and try and work their way through, through that. But at least they're controlling the fact that they can avoid rollover. Rollover is when you arrive with your, with your stuff at the dock, the ship you're trying to get on is full and they roll you onto the next vessel. Well, producers it's an amazing Europe, story, isn't it, George? It really is. And it pr producers in Europe are actually chartering planes coming yeah. out of Asia to bring product into Europe, you know, or yeah. parts of parts of materials that they need. So there's, you know, the, the challenges are pretty steep for them right now. So I, I think that, you know, while, you know, we've read and heard and talked to others who have said, you know, that the onshoring may be an opportunity again, you know, I'm not sure the consumer is ready to pay for all of that, but um, if there are challenges that are insurmountable, you know, I think that we're going to, we may be facing some interesting pivoting happening. And um, I, I, I don't know that it's going to happen tomorrow, but I would imagine that in the back room somewhere in Skunk Works, somebody is working these out and figuring out, okay, how are we going to pull this off if something goes wrong? Well, we some point the pro forma uh, costing, you know, the pro forma projection of, of the cost structure of, of this kind of modeling gets kind of closer to actually owning uh, in-country production at a higher cost. Like at some point that trade-off is less. Yeah. I'm laughing because Christine, prior to going on here today, you were just blown away about the, the uh, Canadian tire story, right? Yeah. Just when does this ever happen? I guess Craig and I were smiling thinking, well, Hudson Bay was doing it. Hudson Bay Company was doing it in the late 1600s, but <laughs> a little like, while ago, David. It's a little different. <laughs> I know. They used, to be, they used to be a little more innovative than they and entrepreneurial. Yeah. But yeah. steam, but canoes and steamboats are a little slower. So yeah, exactly. But they set up all their posts. They actually had Rupert's Land, and they, they actually, actually yeah. hired. Well, anyway, that's a whole other yeah. crazy. Yeah. I mean, I I was was really um, when I read it, I was just really intrigued with it because you know. I think Gary was talking about this earlier. It, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge investment, but it's an investment to you know, bring them to the forefront when their products and goods and services come through there. They've got a stake in the, the pie and they have the ability hopefully to get their stuff in and out quicker than maybe another partner would. So it's just, I think it's fascinating that you know, you just don't typically see that um, investment. But, you know, does that change? I mean, we're seeing Amazon um, getting their own planes and like there's a lot of things where man, like they're just controlling their own destiny because it's like rather than rely on a FedEx, I can rely on myself. I can create that um, functionality and I have control. And I think that piece of when you think about, you know, Gary talking about the piece coming from to the main, like, you know, the North America, there's no control over a lot of that. So it's just, you know, are you the bigger player? Have you spent more money? You know, what, what's your stake in it? A smaller company just gets shoved to the, you know, the end of the, the line. So it then is like, you know, where does this go from a larger kind of positioning perspective? And did these larger brands then start dictating and owning their full supply chain end to end? And that is like a huge expense um situation i think gary you could talk into that a little bit yeah. but it just doesn't seem fully feasible for a lot of brands to be able to do that the, the challenge uh, the, the, the kind of un, the underlying point you're you're making is uh the, i think the assumption you you may be making is that there's full traceability full visibility of as you place your order and the manufacturer makes that pallets worth and you know where that pallet is they're accumulating pallets they put it in a container you've got complete visibility of where that is and there are gaping great holes in that all the way from you know you placing your order right through to when it finds its way towards your dc because when it goes on into docks uh, and often onto marine vessel you, there's tracking system for the marine vessel but you've got to make sure it's actually got itself onto your that, that particular vessel you're tracking. So the actual visibility of these things have been seriously underinvested in by the shipping by the, the ship lines. For years, they, they've said, oh, don't worry, sir, it's on it, it's on the boat, don't worry. And no, I, oh, oh, it's, it's landed in the dock. Oh yeah. Um, 
don't worry, um, we'll hold it for you and we'll charge you demurrage, which we'll tell you what it is, and, and, and we'll release it when we get around to it. So this is what the geographically extended supply chains have been using, uh, experiencing, call it what you like, because this is not a good place to be. And my question about the investment of Canadian Tire in a terminal is, is this a stepping stone to a transition to finding ways of getting stuff done more locally? Or is this actually saying our profile of our business and our consumers, et cetera, we have to now make investments in maintaining that geographically uh, extended supply chain. So we better start now. And it may be a journey to having more control by buying stuff like maybe their own their own boat. Well, my the 25% investment for me is more a signal that they want exposure uh, with a lot of granularity to how the thing works. They're not going to have control, but they're going to have a lot of insight that comes out of that investment. So I, I don't know what their next play is, but that's a great speculation. And, and George, you know, Gary's now talking about the shipping lines. You know, if we, we always talk about ecosystems around retail. So this is so complicated because for the smaller players, they're reliant on third parties, right? They're not going to be able to control all this, but can the third parties pull something together that can compete with a full service end to end supply chain? Well, I mean, a lot of small like-minded retailers would have to create co-ops in yeah. order to be able to do this, right? Because you could end up in a world in 10 or 15 years that there are 100 or 200 large retailers that I'll steal a line from Dune. Whoever controls the spice controls the universe. You know, I mean, that's, that's the scary part about this. And, and it could competitively weed out weaker players very quickly, make it tougher for entry for, ent for others to enter the marketplace. It becomes very complex, right? And, and business is more complex now than it, retailing is more complex now than it was 10 years ago, right? So it's not as easy just to open up a shop. I mean, you've got to be able to ensure that you've got product coming in. So if that gets, start to being controlled by large retailers to a, from manufacturing down to, to distribution, to logistics and everything, then you really start weeding out a lot of smaller players and mid-sized well, players too. We saw in the pandemic that the uh, with too much um, push through the system and not enough capacity that it was the big players dictating to uh, FedEx and UPS yeah. and the like, uh, their prioritization at the expense of others. So, you know, I said there's a couple of pandemic implications that that was definitely one of them. I'm curious, Craig, from your point of view looking at um, real estate plays in Canada, have you heard anything of sort of some joint ventures in the works around uh, hubs or uh, anything, anything real estate wise on supply chain where we're seeing new kind of collaborations? And the so answer may be no, I, you know, we yeah, should have. Well, you can't say. <laughs> off, the, off the top of my head, I can't, really, I can't really think of anything beyond just warehouses, perhaps having space for different businesses within it. Um, I'm not aware of that, but right now the vacancy rate is like 1.7% or something with industrial. It, it's very, very, very low. Uh, it's clear that e-commerce uh, has outpaced the amount of industrial real estate that we have in most parts of Canada right now, which is why Amazon and other companies are trying to, you know, beef up their own real estate just to be able to keep up with, you know, their own supply and demand essentially so they can do business but uh, I, I think this could be quite a concerning situation I mean we're going to need more efficiencies whether or not that's having some stock in a store I mean that's not going to be nearly as cost you know efficient or effective because rent is for small stores going to be higher but you know we're seeing micro fulfillment I think being a thing and, and part of that just might come with necessity if, if businesses uh, can't get the space to be able to fulfill their orders, uh, say remotely to consumers. I, I think that this could actually be quite a concern. And you know what you all brought up here in terms of uh, you know, bigger retailers you know, having the power in the future because the smaller retailers may not be able to you know, be able to play in the space in terms of uh, getting their supply chain in order and whatnot. That's kind of scary if you think about it. I mean, uh, it, it's pretty fascinating to, to, to see that, you know, the big players could pull ahead because they've got the resources to be able to actually just do business and the smaller mm -hmm. ones may not be able to. So 
really, really interesting. I mean, maybe all the small players have to go and sell on Amazon or Etsy or something. I don't know. I mean, it's going to be interesting. Or, <laughs> or Craig, they beca- or, they, or they, their shops become de- uh, deep distribution depots for, for the Amazon and Walmarts of the world. You know? <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, uh, I remember the old Sears. Sears had little um, uh, small locations in small towns where you uh, did so. And, it, and I think they were privately owned. Um, Right. So I, I see that happening, too. I, I, I can see it happening where you own a shop and you distribute product for Amazon or maybe others as well. And you sh- and you and you deliver it, you know, so the more remote areas, that's probably a better plan for a lot of these uh, online players. than actually trying to create more distribution centers. We, in a few minutes, we'll wrap up with sort of what does this mean inside of the you know, we're talking about a lot of external forces that are. Uh, in flux right now and, and what we see some competitors doing. I, I think we, we should also address what is happening inside retail organizations in response to this, or maybe in some cases, uh, a slow response to this might be a more accurate description. But we did talk, we touched on uh, the COVID situation. And besides the fact that there's now a two tier kind of prioritization amongst the, uh, at least the last mile guys, the other big issue has been a lot the inability to get supply and factories are coming online. But Gary, we were talking about this last week that I think everyone, the lay people out there expect that suddenly everything will be back in stock now that everything's opening up again. And you made an excellent point that it can't happen that way. And maybe, maybe just talk about that a little bit. Like how what can we expect in terms of the catch up of the backlog? Yeah. The um I, I think it's going to take Assuming nothing else happened in, in our environment, like further lockdowns in countries, uh, in our country, um, it's going to take about a year to un- unravel because we've had this imbalance. We've had factories full on, but they can't find containers because we can't find containers. So if you can find an empty container somewhere, it's worth some, it's probably worth its weight in gold or something close to that. So you've got this imbalance of manufacturing and orders going in and manufacturing capacity going up and down uh, then you've got have you got pallets have you got containers can you find a skeletal frame can you find a driver and a, a, a tractor unit get it to the port can you is a port still open is the terminal still open was it being shut itself and you've got boats which were in, in the initial part of the pandemic, cancelled or blank, they call it blank sailings, but they were basically cancelled because they were going nowhere fast. They were being empty. So they, they just cancelled the sailings and just let the, the work build up on each side of the, Atlanta, of, of the Pacific. They're fully capped out pretty much. And that's why there's this move to move into chartering a vessel and you just put all your stuff. You might you know, inc- you know, encourage up some other retailers to you know, pay you to get on your, your, your boat. Um, and then there's, there's blockages at our ports, our side of the Pacific, at Los Angeles, Vancouver, whatever. And then there's ch- challenges with, if you're using a rail system, um, it's probably reopened now, but Chicago was closed because so much backlog had occurred at Chicago, which is a main hub for rail, that they decided to close it and try and work off the backlog that was in front of them, knowing that the, the backlog would just accumulate you know, in, in that week or two weeks that they were uh, closed to deal with the backlog. So the whole thing's got out of balance. Well, it sounds like it's like whatever the weakest link in the complex system is going to be the bottleneck. And I guess the other thing is we deal with products that often have multiple components that all come from different places. So it'll be the yeah. like uh, on my vacation last week, the whole issue with renting cars and the fact that Our chat. Yeah. they sold their fleets to preserve cash a year ago. Now they go to buy cars and the cars are missing chips. Yes. And so the whole and, ripple effect of that. Just, just to give a sort of sense of how crazy this world is, we have... I don't know if it's pineapples or pears or whatever it was, grown in Peru, get sent to China to process and be put in little tubs and then get sent to the the home territory, domestic market, US, Canada. I mean, you know, a straight route would be finding finding a food processor that could make that conversion or even having a a food processor in Peru, wherever it was, it was Peru or Chile, whatever it was. And it seemed strange that we are sending something 6,000 miles one way and 6,000 miles the other way because of cost. 
But, but that's it. Like in the old model, which was dictating supply chain, it made perfect sense. And now yeah. we're having a new enlightenment, I guess, as yeah. to what the world's going to be. So let's, let's kind of close on the notion. Maybe we can all speculate a little bit. But if you're inside a, a retail organization today, and let's, let's pick um, ones that are not Walmart, Amazon, like they, they're doing some things, but those that are kind of a little bit freaked out about everything going on right now and say, we need to adapt. And, and they've probably been working on this for a few years, hopefully. What are the kind of things they need to look at uh, internalizing or, or playing with inside the walls to address these issues? Well, if, if I can launch into uh, you know, a real concept of agility, they, they needed to have been developing their supply base to be in different regimes so that they could manage around any kind of border closures in, say, China or Vietnam or you know, Italy or wherever they are currently buying stuff from, and also working with those suppliers in a much more collaborative way so that they, those suppliers will be meeting them together so that they can actually share their demand forecast and say, right, this is the next month's demand. How can we, we collectively as a supply network actually get this done and get it to me in the next two or three weeks? Not, here's an order for the next six months. I hope it turns up on time. <laughs> we have to change that whole dynamic. We have to become what I call price indifferent. And that doesn't mean paying whatever the price is, quite the opposite. It means how do we get, how do we work with the suppliers to reduce their price? so that I can either ask them to do one or 10,000 at very extreme sort of senses, so that I can actually talk to them as a collective and, and say, this is my demand. I need you as a collective to bring it, to, to organise it, sometimes by, by, by uh, marine, sometimes by air, sometimes by road or a combination of that, to get it to my DC in the next three weeks. Well, okay, Absolutely. but all, all due respect on that one, if you're a, let's say you're a Canadian national chain, but mm -hmm. in the scope of the world, mid-size at best, are you going to have the clout to pull that off? And I, I don't, I don't think you're going to. So, uh, yeah, but let, let's hold me. that one and see, George, what, what are your thoughts? Okay. So look, I'm going to be, I'm going to do the ugly side of this. Um, if you're still struggling with the digital transformation, you're going to talk to me about supply chain and try and how you're going to fix that. I don't, I don't think so. I think you're already behind uh, in a big way and they're all, there are, I won't name them, but there are retail chains that are, that are not there with digital transformation and supply chain is changing. It is an evolution happening. It's quick. There's dynamics happening that are geopolitical, their health issues, everything. You know, you cannot, if you can't respond to that right now, I don't know how you have longevity in this game. George is absolutely right. I mean, we have to plan for the future. And that planning means that these people are sitting at the table when conversations are happening around building your brand, building your product, how you're going to distribute it, what the mix of your product is. And we haven't even talked about that, but, you know, the broader the mix, the more challenge it is to deliver the product and service or whatever to your consumers. So, you know, there's a lot of brands that build a lot of product and it's not as productive as it could be. So there's, you know, all these different layers, but I, I think the key is, is understanding that everyone needs to have a seat at the table and you really have to listen to the people that are talking about what's going on with the supply chain and work with them, build relationships, as Gary mentioned. Well, but you're talking about your head of supply chain, basically, right? You, you just got it. Brands um, have got it kind of, you know, again, I think what spurred this for me was thinking outside of the box. So maybe the Canadian tire example isn't like the perfect solution, but they're thinking outside of the box in a way that a lot of other retailers aren't right now. So what is, what's the implication? If this, then that. Um, if you're over here, if everything's in this one place, you know, you don't have a contingency plan. If to George's point, you know, there's a, a health issue or a crisis or whatever else. So it's diversity in, in what you're doing and how you're planning your business, which then adds complexity. But I just, I think that brands have really got to be more focused on scenarios and what things might be happening 
and being able to be nimble and shifting when when situations crop up. And that's it's it's a it's a hard thing to do. Can I say one more thing before you go to Craig? (laughs) Go out there and hire people that are over 50 because they know what's going on. They've been shell shocked a long time ago. They're used to it. You know, the this transformation of moving to y- a lot of younger people who would understand technology, and I completely get it. But you're missing the point here. What you're missing is your ability to compete. And you're going and you're and they're going to get run over. A lot of them are going to get run over. They've pushed far too many senior executives, experienced executives out of their organizations, thinking that youth is the answer. No, no, my, my kids are old enough to, you know, to be working on, they are working on their own. But at the end of the day, look, there are people out there who know what, what to do with this and you've got to bring them back. If you don't, you're going to, you're going to lose very quickly because they don't know what to do. Yeah. And, and, and building on what, what George just said, I would, if I was that Canadian retailer that we're talking about that hypothetical, I, I would be hiring, first of all, Gary Newbury, the expert to be working uh, for me in that because again there's that challenge I'm, I'm clearly not an ageist to the point I'd actually want to hire someone over 50 if they're willing to work for me and I've got a couple of employees who are and they're awesome my thought is you know I'm not to say that there would be an act of desperation out there but my thought is looking short term and long term and looking at ways to optimize what I would have as a retailer here now. Uh, One example would be what we're starting to see with some of the Hudson's Bay stores, granted they have lots of real estate, is they're quietly downsizing these stores so that they have room in the back for product that they can basically have stored there. So they're actually already transforming some of those suburban locations, uh, parts of the stores, not the entire store, but actually creating warehouse space within those stores because they know that they need it because they're implementing this digital first strategy. And it's something that you may lo- notice in your local base store. If you go in, you're like, wait a minute, this is a little bit smaller than I remember. And these walls weren't here before. I've seen it in a few locations and I've sent some photographers out to do it. Um, and my thought again is to be nimble, whether or not that's partnerships, whether or not that's looking at uh, uh, you know, some of these small player shipping companies out there that might be able to fulfill orders. Uh, Uh, My thought is kind of, you know, and as Christine said, again, you know, being creative, it's an all hands on deck and looking at options that you've got for whatever time period we're working with to get the product to the consumer now, and then looking at a long-term strategy on top of that, which may involve a significant capital investment, whatever that might be. And, And that could be buying part of a port. I mean, for most businesses, that is not going to be a viable financial option, but clearly for some, it is like Canadian Tire, but uh, you know, I think a short and a long game is going to be really important and, and to be nimble and to, and to look at what's happening here and, 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 and to look at whatever new technologies are coming out. And as I mentioned earlier, again, I'm just wondering about the whole drone delivery thing here as we uh, move into this new world of autonomous vehicles and, and Lord only knows what else is going to be coming at us because it, it seems like there's, you know, innovators coming out of the woodwork with new ideas and, and hopefully they're able to make it because I know of one, uh, you know, shipping company that's basically, from what I can see, imploding right now. And it's to do with the leadership in that company. It often comes down to people. I won't name the company. But, uh, you know, that I think in itself is unfortunate because we're often, you know, as business people and as analysts looking at things, also having to realize that the fallacy of, of humanity and of, of, of individuals, I think, is a huge challenge. And that in itself can lead to tremendous challenges, you know, whether or not it's at our local, you know, our own retailer that we're talking about or with the companies that we're dealing with. And, and that's a scary thought too, because we're not operating in a, in a perfect world and, and God only knows what's going to happen. And then having that flexibility again, around the fact that we're seeing these news reports around the Delta variant, uh, um, it's more serious than I think we realize. Uh, someone I know has just has gone to another country where, uh, uh, you know, a relative has just passed away yesterday from COVID. And, and this is a really serious thing. We're quite lucky here in Canada right now, uh, not realizing that uh, many are not realizing that we're in a far more serious situation and that things are going to get much worse here potentially and probably will. So it's it's going to be, you know, a crapshoot for the next while, I think. So I, I'm just kind of babbling about it, but but that that's kind of my two cents around this. No, oh, Craig, uh, you, you, you kind of hit, uh, you, you kind of hit what I was really thinking, which is, the people aspect is really paramount. And um, I think you said it very well that uh, 
I, I think if you're a, C, a board or a CEO or an owner, a founder, and you're dealing with this, uh, it's A, you need to understand the talent needed, the experience needed to handle the complexity of this. The answer isn't going to be clear cut, but the, the, the back knowledge of understanding the depth of, of these systems, A, B, that's got to be wedded with a strong understanding of technology because the algorithmic nature of moving all these parts, uh, one human's not going to sort of do it in their head. There's got to be an understanding of how to leverage the, the technology of IT work with supply chain. And for many, that's going to be a culture shift. When I, uh, I moderated a panel a few years ago at Retail Council, stores conference on, on supply chain of the future, and we had some prominent uh, chief supply chain officers, maybe not in title, but in, in role. And offline, they all said uh, they really didn't have the ear of the leadership exec, the, you know, the merchants and the, and the CFO and the CEO. And that's got to stop because all the stuff that I like to do around stores, ultimately the customer is so impacted by supply chain that we have to see that as affecting the stores and online and the customer. And we have to create the space and listen, as you guys have been saying, to the expertise. I think that's the fundamental shift uh, that has to happen. It starts right at the top. This was great. And, um, you know, I think if there's anyone listening to this that is in the supply chain space and you have any comments on this, definitely feed them back to us. If, if we've missed something, uh, you know, send it over to us or pop it into the uh, LinkedIn. We on LinkedIn on the business of retail. You can follow us there. Uh, you can join the dialogue and it'd be great to hear from some of you. Um, Obviously, uh, as we said, subscribe to us if you can uh, on if you have a subscription that you do on a sort of podcast platform, YouTube, follow us on the business of retail. You have been listening to the business of retail podcast, an unflinching strategic alternative to the conventional industry discourse. Thank you for joining us. For more information, please go to www.thebusinessofretail.ca.